live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Monday, February 18th, 2019. It is, uh, well, 44 presidents and one dotard's day, as I mentioned in the morning post up on dailycoast.com, in case those of you listening to Daily Coast Radio don't know where to find Daily Coast on the interwebs. Uh, yeah, that's President's Day. Yeah, there's a guy who claims to be president. I don't know whether there's any correlation between the two, and I don't even know if he's in Washington today. Of course, it's a federal holiday, so I suppose he doesn't have to be. He's been down in Mar-a-Lago for the weekend, and I assume he remains there, and many of you will have seen him uh, attending the uh, omelet bar, at least, uh, if not uh, attending to the nation's business. I'm sure he claims he's working, etc., etc., and as you know, uh, he is, of course, playing golf, but the national press still, two and two, almost two and a half, I guess, years into this, not almost two and a half, but coming up, that will be the next anniversary of sorts, <clears throat> but we're past two years of his golfing and, officially speaking, denying that he's golfing. Did you know that? He continues to deny that he's playing golf, or rather, neither confirm nor deny that he's playing golf. And uh, we usually don't find out until after the fact who he's playing golf with, which is sort of an important thing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but uh, there we are. He's out there pretending he's working while he's out there. And, uh, oh, here's, hey, good morning, Bill. Uh, Daily Coast Radio, he's reminding us now, is live. And in case I forget, at some point, he sends it to me as well. We all see this. Uh, be the 50th caller, and uh, nothing will happen because... Of course, we don't actually have live phone lines, but uh, you can call anyone you want. And if, if you're the 50th person to call that person, they'll let you know. And I will nominate you for the very first Nobel Omelette Bar Prize. That <laughs> a big story over the weekend as the president in uh, his Rose Garden speech prior to taking off for the weekend, the one in which he declared a national emergency and we all had to, I don't know, I think everybody had to hang up the party line phones at the very least in case, I don't know, uh, who would call in this situation. I'm not really sure. Mexico, hi. We're closing the border after all. You win. You've convinced us. <clears throat> uh, crossings, border crossings at a, uh, what, like a 10, 15 year low. But just in case, we'll uh, crack down on things. And then I guess the emergency is over. Everyone witnessed the scene. I think it was actually during the show that we sort of witnessed the the beginning of the lunacy and then, of course, the close of the lunacy coming after the show. That is to say, national emergency, now watch this drive, except, of course, you're not allowed to watch the drive. And I'm taking off for Mar-a-Lago. So big emergency, big omelet emergency, a lot going on. <clears throat> you will have seen this, by the way, uh, also duly noted by Bill, among many uh, many others, that uh, it was noted that the president attended the omelet bar at the golf club in a tan suit, or what passes for a tan suit on the golf course. Anyway, I guess he was in his normal golfing khakis and chose to go along with it somehow, for some reason, a beige-ish, like, uh, long sleeve wind shirt of sorts. I thought the weather looked like it was probably okay down there in Florida, but I guess, you know, maybe he's got poor circulation. I don't know. He's chilly and uh, keeping warm. Other golfers there were playing in shorts, but not the president. <clears throat> there in his tan suit, which is an outrage. Uh, and the skin color, it was sort of a, it was, it was almost like a natural skin color. It was weird to see him in it because, of course, his skin isn't that color. Not really a great outfit choice for uh, bolstering the my orange face is natural and due to my good jeans look. But uh, it did make it look like there was, you know, possibly a, a fat nudist waiting for an omelet at this golf club, which may or may not be an uncommon occurrence there. I don't know. I've never been there. It's a private club. I suppose you could do that, you know, stumble out of the shower and just walk through the grill room and ask for an omelet. Maybe. No one really knows. Eagle-eyed observers, 
uh, noting for us that uh, among the fixins on the fixins bar there at uh, at, for, at the omelet station were uh, two gigantic bottles of Heinz ketchup, and everyone knows the president loves to put ketchup on presumably everything. <clears throat> uh, ketchup not usually a condiment that you know is thought to go along with omelets per se. There was some hot sauce there, and some people do the hot sauce on the eggs. Some people do put ketchup on eggs. It does happen. But, I mean, these were two enormous bottles of ketchup. Like, a lot of people are into ketchup for the omelet bar. Or they just know the president likes it. And even if he doesn't put it on his omelet, they wanted it available. Uh, also, others pointing out it was Heinz ketchup, which I think is a great ketchup choice. But there are those who remember that uh, conservatives from time past were supposed to be boycotting Heinz products because John Heinz's widow, Teresa Heinz, uh, eventually married John Kerry, and so therefore, liberal ketchup, and we're all boycotting it. And that's uh, uh, politically 100 years ago, but <clears throat> I don't think they ever called off the Heinz ketchup boycott. They just, like with most of their boycotts, interest just petered out, and y you know how those things go. Uh, so, uh, all right, well, very interesting developments for the weekend. There are more, of course, uh, including... Uh, as we'll um, no doubt discuss at least uh, a little bit with Greg here. Hi, good morning, Greg. How are you? Hey, good morning. Um, I am uh, fascinated by the fact that uh, the president on his way out the door to the national emergency golf outing noted for the record. Well, first of all, of course, began the emergency declaration by saying, one, I want to talk to you about China and the uh, the fantastic trade negotiations we're having. And he stayed on that for some time. <clears throat> It was a good 10 minutes before he got to the national emergency. Then, of course, he wanted to tell everybody about his uh, big electoral victory, various other things uh, that he was proud of, uh, and then thought he'd throw in there for all of us, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, or a little thing called the Nobel Prize, uh, which he described to us as uh, having been having gotten a copy of the most beautiful letter from the Prime Minister of Japan... Shinzo Abe uh, having nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, my initial reaction to it is I I actually don't believe that. Uh, it's possible, but I'd like to see the letter. And, you know, you got to get the paperwork with this guy on everything. As it turns out, the government of Japan uh, has confirmed, as far as I know, they've confirmed having nominated him, but they wouldn't let it lie at that. They had to add, we're not crazy entirely. Uh, we got a request from the United States government. They're not saying who requested this, by the way, or from what level or from what department. And, or where, I'd love to know who tracks this down. Who's the, the person in charge of fishing around in, among world leaders who are uh, um, uh, permitted nominations sources uh you're allowed to nominate people i guess if you're the head of state of some country and you can prove that and in trump's case you would ask for you know i picture id or something like that right uh, but abe can prove it yeah abe has no trouble that well they take a lot of pictures i understand they're very fond of photography to be totally racist about it uh but i don't know whether they have pictures on their ids or not it doesn't matter he was uh verifiably the head of state and uh, was asked by someone in the United States government, and we don't know who, please, if, you can, if you've got any spare time as Prime Minister of Japan, please pencil this in, nominate our president for the Nobel Peace Prize. The theory being that now, as Trump says, you no longer, because of the, 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 the accords that he's reached with Kim Jong-un, of North Korea no longer have, as he says, rocket ships and missiles flying over Japan. And now they feel good. They feel good. They feel secure. And uh, so for that, well, Nobel Peace Prize. Kind of, that's kind of a problem, though. I mean, because the Japanese and the North Koreans are not getting along that well. Mm. And so, yeah, it's true that uh, Abe uh, nominated him. It's true because somebody... Uh, asked him to, yes. whether it was Trump or somebody else. But it's also true it's creating an incredible uproar and a lot of bad stuff oh. in Japan because the blowback is, what are you doing threatening our country with somebody who's trying to shoot missiles at us? Mm. So that was one of three things that Mark Murray pointed out at the news conference that Trump did. The second was 
undermining the legal basis for declaring an emergency by saying, I didn't really have to do this, there's no rush. I almost forgot. And also that uh, it was a lie that the preponderance of illegal drugs crossing the border yes. uh, do so at a port of entry, when in fact it's the truth. Yeah. And, and of course, that was one of the better scenes with uh, reporters of various uh, outlets saying, where do you get your numbers from? And Trump says, well, basically, I get them. Yes. Shut up and the sit down. The point is, I've received them. Stop asking me questions. Who the right. hell are you? Get out of here. <laughs> I, it's basically what he did. Yeah. And so, you know, it was pretty much on Nobel display. Prize. Yeah, right. Nobel Prize stuff. I think uh, the no, reporters Nobel should Prize know for uh, communications and gaslighting. <laughs> I guess so. I, so uh, I imagine we'll never get to the bottom of it, although some enterprising reporter should see if they can track it down. I think we should but, put a halt on all of it until we get to the bottom of it. I, I, I do, too. And I, I, I'm not kidding, either. I mean, it, it makes good fodder for jokes, but apparently... Uh, now, Trump believes that he has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize before. And part of the reason for that, part of the reason for that is he's a delusional idiot. The other part of the reason for it is that another delusional idiot said he was nominated for it. And in fact, I know this because, I, not me, but this delusional idiot says, I know this because I nominated you. Apparently, Trump has been nominated, uh, I think maybe twice before, both. <clears throat> Both nominations, it turned out, in, in case you need a, an even more incredible story about this, both nominations uh, forged, basically. Somebody <clears throat> pretended to be a head of state and an eligible nominator and nominated him for the Nobel Prize, and they had to have an investigation at the Nobel Committee. Is this a legitimate nomination? They decided no. Somebody is submitting, I don't know whether it's Trump's idea or not, forged Actual, honest to God, forged nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize. Never, ever accept paperwork from this person. Oh, come on. It, it was legitimate. It was a member of the uh, U.S. government. It was yeah. the, the uh, delegate. Sure. Uh, it was the uh, House representative from North Carolina 9. <laughs> it could have been. Or maybe it was, uh, what's his name, the uh, the the Twitter account congressman that's a, that's a from California 54th. Right now, the <laughs> yes. That could, well, I think every our listeners know. I say, oh yes, mm. I'm absolutely aware of that. That's. Oh, uh, David knew. I knew. <laughs> I you knew. I wasn't telling you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I don't know, man. By the way, I, uh, I forget what I say on a uh, show from time to guess, time. Guess who won an Emmy for that reporting? Uh, the, which reporting? On, uh, on, the, on North on Carolina Nine. Oh, already an Emmy? I, you don't have to wait yeah. until next year for that. Who? It, it, the uh, the the Channel Nine team that was You're reporting on that that we were we were discussing. A look at this. Okay. Uh, Them. Uh, they they went down and and started uh, you know digging around and found uh, all the shady stuff and and it was a TV report that uh, brought a lot of that to ah. our attention. All right, well congratulations to the I'm still guessing as to who we they were are, citing but... them on the air and and they won an Emmy. Uh, all right, so send us money and we'll cite you on the air and you can have one too. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, some things I wanted to point out. Uh, I had this on the pundit roundup this morning. Uh, for example, uh, Nate Silver writing, Trump keeps doubling down on the same failed strategy and it keeps not working. But Tim O'Brien, no. uh, who has worked with him in the past, I think helped to uh, uh, write Art of the – is that the guy who wrote Art of the Deal or just somebody who's been covering Trump forever? Oh, which one? I can't remember anymore. Uh, Timothy O'Brien at Bloomberg. No, I don't believe so. I, uh, he wrote I, his own book on, uh, yeah, okay. on Trump. In Trump's world, he never loses. His Rose Garden speech declaring a national emergency and his decades of self-aggrandizement are more closely related than you might think, not – Oh. Us because we follow him. <laughs> yes, that was the headline. Every guy. time he loses, he claims he wins. We said that from the beginning that that's what was going to happen. I was a little surprised that uh, he went ahead with the national emergency because it's such a dumb idea. But uh, I guess I should have realized it was such a dumb idea that he was going to go ahead with it. And by the way, ah, it's not really playing gotcha. all that well right at the moment. These are uh, things, well. uh, moves like this that are supposed to unite your party and divide the other party right kind of wedge issue kind of stuff moves like jagger and uh in fact it's the other way uh it's Don't. united democrats and divided republicans who are really nervous about this when it uh comes to the senate vote doe president yeah okay right so uh in fact uh there are a couple of uh, pieces from the bulwark pizzas did you say <laughs> pieces ah written pieces uh, that kind of highlight the problems here. Um, I didn't have this in the list. I, I think I may have uh, highlighted oh. this in the pun roundup on Saturday, but 
I'm going to give you this one because I thought it was really good. It's by Andrew Egger. It's over at the conservative uh, site, The Bulwark, okay. which has become where the weekly standard refugees went when the boat capsized there. Ah. No one hates the immigration plan more than Trump's base. Hmm. Right? Which is a really an important concept. Yeah. Here's maybe the king of the immigration hawks, Mark Krikorian of the Center for Immigration Studies, beseeching Trump not to sign the bill. This is the same thing that Ann Coulter did. Oh. The text of the funding bill was released last night, says Krikorian, and lawmakers are expected to vote on the 1,169-page measure we saw Nita Lowy carrying it to, to the House yes. as early as this evening. The bill is disappointing in many respects, but it, if it had been ad, as advertised, it might have been tolerable. But my fear is that Senators Durbin and Leahy would trick the Republican conferees, Tricky. none of whom knows the first thing about immigration policy, or realize that. Okay. Standing out among the many distasteful provisions are two poison pills that I hope the Republican committee uh, either didn't know or didn't understand. And then he goes on to <laughs> describe how the bill understand. sneaks in provisions huh. requiring the Department of Homeland Security to get permission from local elected officials before building barriers in counties along the border. Oh. A lot of those are Democratic counties, by the way. Oh, OK. Right. Even worse, he says. The bill blocks border security agents from detaining, quote, anyone who has effectively any relationship with an unaccompanied minor, either because they're sponsors in the same household as sponsors or even just potential sponsors or in the household of potential sponsors of such a child. So, in other words, uh, if you're a family coming together, you can't just, like, dump them into detention like they're doing right. now. Split this is anti-baby jail stuff, and it passed. Wow, gee whiz. And the president that signed it. Have, yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, it did pass. He might have signed it. The, the yes. website well, says there are, he did. There, there are pictures. I haven't seen him do it. Well, I don't know. I saw a picture of him at a desk with no one around him, which looked like a really Well, it was also black scene. and white, so like it, yeah. it really so it happened in life, 1850, right? for one thing. So that doesn't sound. The daguerreotype. And, uh, yeah, but uh, strangely, it makes him look even more orange in black and white. Right. Uh, right. But, uh, but it's a rare thing, uh, empty it's, desk signing. Yes. It's genuinely difficult to put into words just how bananas this all is. The mm, president bananas. of the United States is currently setting the concept of constitutional governments on fire, making a mockery of every conservative warning about the imperial presidency and hanging his allies warning. in Congress out to dry to boot, all in an apparent effort to placate the immigration wing of his base who are shrieking for him not to do the thing he is nevertheless doing. Well, that's Trump. That, that, that's a Rachel Maddow kind of way of saying it. Yes. Uh, yeah, except for she would probably note that there's also every progressive and liberal warning about the imperial presidency, too. Yeah, but uh, this but is he's looking, not him. Uh, the point here is that it really does split his uh, his party. Good. I would also, if I were in it, split his party. Right. Uh, subterfuge or ignorance on McConnell's part isn't enough to bail Trump out. After all, the White House has had ample time over the last two days to process the Hawks' arguments and change course accordingly. And yet on Friday, landmines or no landmines, Trump signed the bill. Or they Maybe. claim he did, you say. After know. dragging the nation through months of grinding political brinksmanship for the express purpose of making the Hawks happy, he suddenly sold them out for a song. And yes. that song was The Entertainer, and you could see it because <laughs> when he was talking about the, yeah. what was going on in his press conference in a sing-songy uh, way, uh, somebody added The Entertainer to it, and it's just exactly the right notes. So yeah, it's it very, really, very funny. funny. And, and uh, as the guy who did the thing, you sent it to me over the weekend. I don't know if I can play it on the air or not. I'll see if I can rig it up. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's Trump struggles to get through The Entertainer. That sing-songy thing that he did, I... I understood what they meant, sing songy, but but I didn't have a song in mind. But yeah, as it turns out, he just keeps doing the opening lines of the entertainer and not quite making it to the second phrase over and over. This is a good video. We'll we'll uh, put it in a roundup for everybody. Right. So poison pills or no poison pills, the spending yes. bill is now the law of the land. And whether you saw him sign it or not, everybody assumes he did. So it's the same thing. It's not. But OK, it is uh, right. in a couple of days. It will be. The uh, other piece that the bulwark that I thought was entertaining, speaking yes. of the entertainer, is uh, a list <clears throat> that Jim Swift is making and keeping oh, and checking it twice, whether lists. you're naughty or nice. Mm. This is conservative critics of Trump's non-emergency declaration listed, uh, including okay. senators Susan is. Collins, Lisa it. Murkowski, Pat Toomey, Lamar Alexander, Ben Sass, Sassy Sass, 
Marco Rubio. I never know how to pronounce his name because Marco. I'm always struck by the fact that he says something and then does the opposite. So yes. I think that's more important than how you pronounce his name. Marco Rubio, Ron Johnson, Tom Tillis, John Cornyn, Mike Rounds, South Dakota, Chuck Grassley, Rand Paul, Maybe. Roy Blunt, Mike Lee. Uh, those are just the senators who have expressed unhappiness with this. That doesn't mean they're all going to vote against it. Yeah, well, but there are plenty of articles that say, speaking uh, off the record, there's at least 10 senators who feel like they might vote against this. So <laughs> if Nancy Pelosi does that thing that she does, yeah, that thing that you do, where uh, she has a disapproval bill on the House mm. and then it goes to the Senate, which has to act on it within 18 days unless they choose not to do anything. But I'm going to skip that unless they choose not to do anything because that's confusing. And let's pretend they actually do have to act on it. All right. And with 10 senators already uh, saying that uh, on record they're not happy, that thing might pass. Then it goes to Trump who vetoes it. I'm not talking about a veto override. But the very fact that it goes that far is a pretty public repudiation of Trump's stance on this. Oh. All right. Uh, well, I, it's a, it is a good repudiation. I like it. I had a little back and forth apparent. I didn't mean to, but I had a little back and forth with Rand Paul's chief of staff because Rand Paul among, is among probably five or six Republican senators who have a growing reputation for saying, oh, I'm unhappy and I oppose. And then push comes to shove. They vote for it. And yeah, he's he, among he's them. like top of the list. Yeah. He's very high on the list, and uh, I guess that's news to his chief of staff or something like it, or, you know, he gets paid to pretend that he's never heard of such a thing before. But he's one of the top offenders, and as I pointed out to him, and he didn't really particularly care, as a purported libertarian, you don't need more than half a dozen words to craft a statement on something like this. You're just like, are you kidding me? Hell no, of course not. I oppose this, and I'll oppose it to my with my dying breath. But and instead, but Meh, I'm kind of, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. Now, that's not what libertarians say. So one, you're a flip flopper. Uh, two, you're in his pocket. Three, you were never a libertarian. That's the end. Tom, I'm but done with that segment. Rand Paul is on record of saying is I'm not in favor. <clears throat> yes. Revenue right. raising and spending power was given to Congress. Mm, that yeah. doesn't give you any idea of how he'll actually vote. No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Not him. And uh, when the issue is a veto override, I mean, he'll, he, he may vote for it when it comes through the first time. And if it gets vetoed and he says, well, the president is entitled to, do, 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 you know, all right, then you really don't oppose it. Or, you know, I mean, we may never know because they might he might be first in line for a pass, but there won't be any passes really on a on a veto override. You can't spare him. Right. Uh, meanwhile. Let's talk about how things are playing in the real world while Trump is trying to distract with all of this. Uh, and it's it's not going over well, as you can you know hear from the number of Republicans who haven't rallied around Mitch McConnell's support of this. Yes. And over well is how he likes his omelets. Mm. Uh, the other thing about that omelet thing, of course, is how much hair was missing. He was wearing a hat. Oh. And like it was like he was bald. Like, did he tuck it up under, maybe? Or maybe it was well, all in the omelet. it didn't look that way at all in the picture. If you look at the picture, it's like he's, uh, you there know, were, curly hmm. from the Three Stooges. Oh, I'll have a look at that. I thought, uh, all right, I did hear somebody say that his hair was... It's missing. Like it had been cut short in the back. And other people complained. There were a lot of people who who were sure that this was a forgery picture, too. I just Because it wasn't right there. here. Anyway. Uh, right. Uh, just thought I'd mention that Also, he looked kind of slim, actually. <laughs> I mean, for him. So uh, while all this is happening, people's tax refunds are starting to come back. Oh, OK. Mine? Uh, let me just read you a quote. This is from uh, Huff Huffington Post. Tax refund fiasco <laughs> is political payback for Republicans is the title of the article. Hmm. They stepped there on this is. rake last year and now it's hitting them in the face. To give you an idea of how this is going. Hmm. And the quote is, I almost fell out of my chair. I could not believe it said Beth Calori of Long Island. Uh, pardon me. That's Long Island. Oh, I voted for Trump. I thought he was going to be good for the country. And when I got that phone call about the taxes I owed, that's it. I'm done. Well, I presume, I hope for her sake, the phone call was from her accountant and not from the IRS. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, hmm. So, well, she she thought he was going to be good for her and he turned out not to be. Right. Uh, All right. So the whole story by Arthur Blaney and the Huffington Post about that. Hmm. Um, So, uh, you know, 
this is among the many things that is not going well that people aren't focused on in the media, but that like real life people yeah. are absolutely focused on. And it's just interesting because, uh, you know, nobody in New York liked them anyway, except for Staten Island and Long Island. I and so, so you know what? <laughs> Those folks aren't going to like them too much either now. Yeah. Uh, not to mention, you know, the chair industry out there. They're really going to have to do some work on this. Keep their people in there. Uh, so everyone fasten your seatbelts as you open your tax refund. Right. Don't fall so out of your chair. After the break, which is just coming up, we're going to talk about how yeah, Republicans plan on running in 2020 when everybody hates Trump and these things are not going well. Uh -huh. And uh, I'll just remind you that once upon a time, uh, when they ran against uh, George McGovern, they used acid amnesty and abortion. Okay. Democrats That's... are the party of acid amnesty and abortion. Awesome. Of course, the funny thing is who oh, said that? Uh, who? <laughs> Tom Eagleton, who was McGovern's uh, running mate. Oh. <laughs> All right. He was the one who came up with the phrase, which uh, was one of the many reasons why McGovern really lost badly. Hmm. But, you know, these days it's really difficult to uh, – because the Republicans want to paint the Democrats as the party of socialists like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Mm -hmm. It's just really hard to run against Democrats as being the party of Medicare and tax returns. Yes, and uh, they've taken over the alliteration as well, and, uh, and they're happily, uh, happy and proud of – it being the party of uh, gods, guns, gays. I think grits got thrown in there at one point by uh, 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 Mike Huckabee. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's not a dead concept. But No, uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit afterwards. And then we'll talk about uh, Facebook, how they're screwing you, and how Cambridge Analytica was interviewed by Robert Mueller over it. Yes, I did. Uh, I heard about that when I put the article aside. And then uh, I did say, uh, Marcy Wheeler threw cold water on it saying, uh, oh, well, I mean, it happened, but it actually happened a couple of months ago. And I guess the story never broke, and we all feel foolish somehow. But who cares? We'll catch up on the story because we didn't know no, it before. We, we just we found do. out. That's what's important. Right. Yes. <laughs> I just woke up. It's not my It's not fault. like Mueller just found out. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new interruption, though it's still aimed at saying thank you to all of you who are supporters of the show. We've made a lot of progress. When we first started this campaign, fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners were donating to help keep us on the air. And now, that's down to about 1 in 15. But we've got a long way to go. Remember, it won't take much. Our average monthly donation is currently about $7.00 for which you're getting two hours of great news and entertainment five days a week. What's that, 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal. But as a wage, well, I think Democrats would be against it. But if we all put our 70 cents together, or even half of us, that'd really be something. And my kids could go to college. Now, that's not all on you. But remember, Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is there to make it easy. You can find us there by searching Kagro X or David Waldman or Kagro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box. And you'll be right there where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your continuing support. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. We continue with Greg Dworkin uh, warning me uh, the weather system coming in here. Uh, we, the kids you guys are, are going to have weather in the middle of the week. Holiday. Just yes. Saying. So Wednesday, it sounds like, yeah. Well, Tuesday uh, we, night for Wednesday, you're either going to get snow or sleep. Yes. Uh, you might have to build a sleep man. Right. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty weird. And, and backwards, that clip you sent me, I guess it's raining further north or wetter anyway. And, and the, the cold air is down here, down south, which is, you know, climate change or whatever. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the kids will probably enjoy that. Uh, so a special ASMR uh, version of K Run in the Morning on Wednesday for those of you who enjoy the sound of uh, spoons hitting the bottom of cereal bowls. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, so uh, here's a piece from The Guardian. Flag-waving and Democrat bashing Trump's blueprint to win in 2020. He Sounds plans good. to sell a simple message of economic prosperity threatened by radical left-wingers. Hmm, where is this it, prosperity? Uh, well, you is know, it, if you're not getting your tax returns, it? that kind of falls apart a little bit. I see. Yeah. Oh, I have economic anxiety. If you're going to run against the party of Mikey Sherrill and Abigail Spanberger and, and – uh, and uh, Connor Lamb, you know, good. Okay. Uh, plus social mullisms. I guess they're going to throw that in there on us. So Democratic pollster and strategist Linda Lake basically says what Trump's trying to do. And you could see this in his uh, uh, State of the Union speech, talking about abortion and all the chatter about infanticide and all that sort of stuff. Fun. Is they're basically trying to shore up the evangelical Christian vote. 
Yes, because they and have a lot truth. of this, in fact, Josh Chaffetz uh, has a piece in the Washington Post saying, you know, this whole emergency declaration mm-hmm. is not about reelection; it's about trying to preserve himself. He says, for one thing, Trump is losing the war for the hearts and minds of the American public. His approval rating is low. It's been underwater since the second week of his presidency. Of the post-World War II presidents, only Reagan had a lower net approval rating at this point of his first term. The border wall has long been unpopular, and declaring an emergency to build it without congressional approval is even less popular, with only about a third of Americans in favor. That's his base. Those are the evangelicals. Trump's position seems designed to ensure that his most diehard supporters don't desert him, a rear guard action better calculated to stave off impeachment than to build the sort of coalition necessary for re-election. Oh. And then goes to talk about the opposition in Congress from his own party over this uh, yeah, we'll uh, see. emergency stuff. Could be. Uh, all right. That's his plan. And, you know, right. he's got great plans, and they usually work out fantastic. Yeah, plan one is preserve myself. Plan two is then I'll worry about re-election. <laughs> but, you know, obviously I've, I've said this, you know – I just don't see it. We we had a nice little summary of all the different pieces on Saturday uh, on the Pundit Roundup about people pointing out from Nate Silver to Rachel Bitkoffer, who's a political scientist at the Wayson Center, uh, that, you know, Trump's numbers are just awful. And the number of people who say they will not vote for him is pretty high. So it's not that he can't get reelected. Of course he could. But he's far from being the favorite. Yeah. Even Beth hates him in Long Island. Yeah, well, Beth isn't going to vote for him now. Not that he was going to carry New York State because he wasn't going to. Ah, right. Your vote doesn't count anyway, Beth. Stay in your chair. Right, exactly. So uh, there's that in The Guardian. And in The New York Times, Republicans already are demonizing Democrats as socialists and baby killers. What? If that sounds extreme, they're kind of desperate. <laughs> Does it sound extreme? Baby killing. Hmm. It does sound a little extreme. Right. The unusually aggressive assault, which Republican officials and strategists outlined in interviews last week, is meant to strangle the new Democratic majority in its infancy. Oh, wait a minute. They're talking about infanticide and now they're going to strangle the new Democratic majority in its infancy. Maybe that's the infanticide they're talking about. Oh, right. It's projection again. Could be. Yeah, they always do that. So it was set in motion by Trump, who used the State of the Union, talk about socialism. And then talked about uh, Democrats in New York and Virginia allowing babies to be ripped from the mother's womb moments before birth, which, of course, isn't true. In fact, the majorities of the public support, and there was just a poll about this in Virginia, uh, support uh, uh, late abortions if it turns out you need to save the mother's life. So, you know, period, Mm. end of sentence. Then last week, Republicans amped it up, seizing on a Twitter post by a freshman representative, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, which even some Democrats condemned as anti-Semitic. We didn't talk about this yes, much. At least but I also didn't others you. didn't, right. Uh, ridiculing the Green New Deal um, and then going after uh, socialism. They think they've got 55 re- uh, Democratic uh, House members who are going to be vulnerable to this. Mm, Democrats, yeah, on sure. the other hand, see uh, efforts to use women and minorities, especially women of color, as symbols <laughs> of the radical others. And... Uh, uh, basically, Sindel Lake says, and Rick Wilson, uh, Republican strategist, agrees, you know, Republicans can't win this election. You know, Democrats can lose if they do everything wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not above, you know, uh, possibility. We're working on it. But, uh, you know, they're in a really bad position, and that's why they're getting so aggressive about all of this. Okay. Well, that's sort of what they do. Right. Uh, Democrats dismiss the messaging as par for the course. In other words, that's just what they do. Yeah. I mean, I, I do. Anyway, I, I I did notice over the weekend that we got some sage advice from Richard Painter, who uh, is – I don't actually know who Richard Painter is. Apparently, he ran – he's a law professor at the University of Minnesota. He's an uh, ethics guy. Yes. He used to work for the Bush administration. He, is, he yes. hates Trump. He decided to become a Democrat and run in the Minnesota primary. Right, and then he lost. He so lost now he's badly. an independent. Uh, so he lost, so now he's an independent. But he had this great advice uh, over the weekend. Democrats should – could stop Trump's socialism scare tomorrow. So Bye. that was on uh, the seventeenth, which was yesterday. So that's today. We've yeah, got to stop we, socialism. What do we do today scare. to stop all of that? Oh, uh, by saying that they don't support socialism, that their policy proposals are not socialism, and that they uh, seek to improve capitalism to make it work for all Americans. 
Uh, and if in other we words, can't, they should run yeah. for cover and duck and yeah. look weak because that would help them. Well, if we can't make that distinction, then we deserve to lose, he said. And right. so, Dick, uh, Dick Durbin some, said, some and instead he had a different approach. He said, we're not going to abandon socialist policies like Social Security. Yeah. Or is it socialist security? Right. Is that what the uh, Republican? I'm telling you, the Democrats are going to be the party of Medicare. And all of this discussion about all the different various and sundry ways with some new entries mm. into that as to how to get uh, universal coverage. In fact, there are some uh, new bills being uh, suggested. And uh, who had this? Jonathan Cohn had a story about this. Look, two liberal Democrats are promoting a twist on Medicare for all, a big government plan with a role for pl- private insurance. And that's Rosa DeLora and Jan uh, Schakowsky. Okay. Calling Medicare for America, a comprehensive oh, government-run America. insurance program that would replace the big existing federal programs as well as the private insurance policies, but large employers would get to keep offering private coverage, leaving employees with the choice mm. of sticking with their company plans and moving to the new public option, where they right. potentially could get much lower premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. All right, by me. Complicated trade-offs. It? It's just ambitious enough to carry the same political liabilities as the Sanders bill, but not ambitious enough to carry its strengths. Medicare for America envisions less sweeping changes really? than Medicare for all, but could mean leaving in place more of the current system's waste and complexities, but Excellent. also the comfort of knowing that you don't have to change it if you don't want to and, and you make it voluntary, which is very popular with the public. Uh, well, yeah, people like to have choices. So, so the out, point so. is Democrats are coming out with seven or eight different ideas well, that's socialism all by itself about how to Somehow. do universal coverage without necessarily being at Medicare for all. But they're the party of Medicare. They've always been the party of Medicare and Republicans are doing their best to reinforce that. And I don't understand why that's smart politics. I do not know, uh, except for the fact that they've mostly gotten the press to go along with the idea that uh, these things are socialism and therefore bad and scary. And we have to ask everybody if they I haven't seen socialism. that yet. I've seen the, the reporters saying that they say it's socialism, but I yes. haven't seen them saying it is socialism. Well, you know, I, uh, I, I th- that's true. But they do. Uh, they t- I, I, There was a good observation I also saw made over the weekend is that gets asked a lot. Well, you know, isn't that socialism or are, what do you say to people who say that's socialism? And I'm, I am waiting. The point. Medicare really and was, roads and, and right. the post office. I, well, you know, I was I mean, waiting there's, there's for There's a number when, of things that. It's the same answers because they've been the same questions that people have been bringing up for 50 years. Yes, uh, but during the past 50 years or more pointedly during the past uh, two years, the point to this person's tweet was, uh, why do we not see uh, reporters sitting down with Republicans asking? So, you know, as they do with Democrats, well, are you a socialist? Is this a socialist program? Uh, Are you a fascist? Is this a fascist program that you're endorsing? That's beyond the pale. Well, that's stupid. I'm not going to sit and ask him if he's a fascist. I might as well ask him if he's a Martian. Right. We can't insult Republicans. We only insult Democrats. Right. And so I thought that was that was a very strong point. You don't see a lot of reporters musing, pondering as reporters, as opinion colonists. Yes. As reporters musing whether or not they're talking to a fascist. No, doesn't happen. Mm. Good point. Well, you know, but people do talk a lot about authoritarianism. That's true. Right? It's just, not as loaded a word, but they talk about that right. all the time. Well, right. Just as Trump uh, makes misleading statements, he's also an authoritarian. Everyone loves that. Uh, you know, not, not everybody is as afraid of the word Well, you mean he's a lying fascist, fascist, but people won't say right. that. Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's part of the issue, yes. Uh, why not say it? Uh, he's a misleading authoritarian. I you mean, know, it, you know the answer you're going to get. Because people are more comforted by that. They don't feel I like it's so. as radical to say something like but, that. But, you know, a reporter feels confident in asking a, a uh, Democrat, well, what about social? Are you a socialist? Oh, no, no, no. My, 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 no, no, of course not. Well, are you well, a fascist? But, well, why can't they just say, oh, my, no? All right, let, let me put push back on, little, on this a little bit. There are people, Alexandria Ocasio is one famous one, yeah. who in fact run calling themselves yeah. democratic socialists. Right, true. Right? There are not well, people running. They should because it would be accurate, but they are not running on the Republican side calling themselves authoritarian fascists, which you then get to ask about the label. Well, it says fascist right here yeah. in your party name. Why I are guess. you not a fascist? Well, they don't well, ask ridiculous. Alexandria insulting to me, And that's a radical thing to say. Yeah. But it says right here you're a fascist. Well, they well, don't ask her that. They don't, no yeah. one asks her, are you a socialist? Because the answer is obvious. But they do ask everybody else, well, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is in your party. 
aren't does that make you a socialist? Yeah, but no, if, I mean, if you're going to use the name, Steve you King is in your party. Are question. you a racist? There's no way around it. The funny thing is that if you're under forty, you don't really care. You think the whole discussion right. stupid. Well, that's probably true. But uh, you know, I mean, okay, so their branding uh, materials are inaccurate, but. I still, I, I, I do think that they ought to ask those questions. Or you, I haven't even really seen anybody say, so are you an authoritarian at heart? But is that because it's not on the ticket? They don't identify as such, I guess. Well, so they don't That's, have that open, you know, I but guess. I think they should. Mm, <laughs> and Trump yeah. would say, I'm not an authoritarian. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> yeah, <pretty laughs> like much. he did at his press conference yeah. when somebody started asking him about the okay. statistics that he based his uh, uh, immigration policy on. Yeah. I'm not an authoritarian. Sit down. Okay, well, sir. If you're telling me to sit down, does that mean you are an authoritarian? I, I shut just thought up. the more well, interesting story. Sir, if you're story, asking then... me to shut up, does that mean you <laughs> are an authoritarian? It sir? makes for good questions. I mean, it's certainly, honestly, I guess I, I understand your point. If the label is adopted, you should pay some attention to it. Yeah, um, take them at their word. On the other hand, it's a less interesting question than the one where it looks like they're trying to cover up the fact that they're authoritarian fascists. Why don't you want to be an investigative reporter about that? I know you didn't choose the label, but isn't it I true? Know, I know, but I'm just I'm reminded of Walter Mondale. Yeah, I, Your Honor, yeah. I have to, by the way, in pleading that I'm, uh, we're both going to raise I've, your taxes, but I'm I just not a told her I would. Yes, right. Right. Okay, yeah. great politics. Thank you very much. Yes, well, the jails are full of people who don't adopt the uh, the uh, label of convict, for instance, or guilty, <laughs> and right. we all know that. Right, but you know it is an opening, and and you know it is it's understandable why people ask that question, given the fact that you put that in your bio. Yeah, I guess so. But they don't ask them; they ask everybody else. You all card with this you know label which is not bad and uh but and and it just it, it seems like a waste of time other people have labeled themselves this are you that well that seems like a dumb question don't you think that if i was i would label myself that right uh we'll have to leave it there you're a socialist okay labeling you know is is a thing no uh, no labels uh, Matt Brunig uh, came thing. out with an interesting set of uh, parenting initiatives that Democrats might be able to sign on to. Parenting initiatives. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, family leave, daycare, things like that. All right. All right. And what he called it, <laughs> it's getting a lot of attention, which is really kind of cool, is the family fun pack. <laughs> Okay. Rather than calling it a socialist approach ah, to, yes. to uh, you know, uh, making it easier for fam for working families to do their jobs and and live their lives, it's called the family fun pack. Sure. That's good marketing. For example, yeah. it's got the baby box. Three months before the birth of a child, each family will receive a box that contains essential items like clothes and bottles and the box itself doubling as a bassinet. Or oh. parental leave. Families will receive 36 weeks of paid leave for the birth of a child in single-parent families. The sole parent is entitled to all 36 weeks. In two-parent families, each parent is entitled to 18 weeks, but may transfer up to 14 to the other one. I or see. free child care, free pre-K, free school lunch, free health care, and child allowances. Uh, $300 per month for every child that's caring under the age of 18, replacing the child tax credit. And then there's a timeline of when the benefits for children would uh, kick in. And the graph is kind of funny because it looks like the vaccination schedule for children. You know, <laughs> okay. this one at three months, this one at six months, this one at three years. Uh, but it's not called uh, a socialistic approach to making life easier for working families. It's called the Family Fun Pack. All right. I, it's an experiment. It's a weird name, but uh, Okay. Maybe people will talk more about the name. Uh, although, I wonder if we're going to start saying, it's not fun, it's socialism. Well, that's not authoritarianism, it's fascism. Yep. All right. Or so anyway, uh, there, there, you know, you want to talk about labeling and how you describe things? Yes. I actually think that's pretty clever. That, it now, may does work. it change the substance of any of this stuff? No, it does not. No, that wasn't his, he didn't say it would. You're no, right. and he didn't say it would. That's interesting. All right. I don't know if it'll work, but it's worth a try because... Well, now you know, and your listeners will know when you hear reference to the family fun pack. That's yeah, what we're talking about. And by the way, a lot than pretty darn good it. policies. Good, uh, I'm, and I'm I'm glad for the change in labeling. I mean, I don't know whether he spent any time trying to make an acronym that spelled family out of it, but that's a waste of time. Family fun, I like it. I'll give it a shot. If it works, great. If it doesn't, no worse than we have been. 
Even if you don't remember a single policy, you will remember that name now. Uh, maybe. Armando, Armando says, no, it won't. Uh, it's never going to be mentioned again. He says, and, and, and that may be true too. And it may be because who's Matt Brunick, you know? Yeah, uh, that may be. Anyway, yeah, we'll see. We'll see as, as time goes on, as policies, as all of these, uh, uh, people running for president and there appear to be a lot of them, uh, we'll see who adopts it, who doesn't, where it goes, where it doesn't go. This is the part of the campaign that's kind of fun in the sense that all these ideas get thrown out there. If one of them doesn't have to be perfect, so what? Who cares? We're talking about things that people care about. And uh, again, you don't have to have a specific uh, – this is the one way that everybody's going to get Medicare for all. In fact, what we're talking about are various and sundry ideas about universal health care and it's great that it's all on the table we're the party of ideas and we're talking about things that are going to help people right as opposed to uh oh tables. well you're all a bunch of socialists well okay fine if that's what you mean by socialists i think people will vote for that uh yeah well we'll uh we'll see i armando seems particularly offended by the idea that matt Brunner could possibly have an idea and i you know he's not running for I, it, anything it, it did take me aback <laughs> it's an <laughs> interesting actually, idea when i read it and I read it through other people reading uh -huh. it. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty I, clever. I remember seeing it tweeted around and saying, what kind of name is that? Family Fun Pack. And that may be all it takes to you know get somebody to notice it. I would be astonished if anybody introduced it as a bill and called it that. But Oh, it won't be called that. But, uh, but, but they should try that. I actually, I actually do think <laughs> it might make an interesting idea to, to break out of the – Pack. Well, it is a I, pack. I think I it's better than doubling down on nothing, which is what Trump is doing. That is, well, yes. There's going to be other plans. I think the idea of, if we can, anything to stop people from trying to come up with acronyms that spell something that's yeah. supposed to be a one liner about a the bill. stupid egg. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, uh, we're, I'm willing to give it a try. I don't know if the, if the uh, idea of sending everybody a box that is actually a bassinet is a great idea, but okay. Right. Right. Socialists trying to tear up plans in the dark. It's this stupid act. We want it passed tomorrow. Uh, you know, so lots of different <laughs> ways that can go. Uh, before I go and give you the show back, just a, a word about Robert Mueller and, and uh, Matt guy, this Cambridge yeah. Analytica and okay. uh, Facebook stuff. Please. First of all, a piece from uh, Darren Samuelson in Politico. Trump can't run the Mueller playbook on New York feds. For starters, they have jurisdiction over the president's political operation and businesses, subject to executive privilege doesn't cover, with uh, uh, tantalizing speculation that may not they may not feel bound uh, about uh, about indictments the way uh, that Mueller and the special counsel do. Aww. So it's a reminder that even if the new uh, attorney general, Barr, oh yes, right, we have one who uh, has uh, committed himself to sitting on this report, and even if a report never comes out, which is certainly possible because there's no obligation to under the current law, as I understand it, not that I'm a lawyer, but uh, the public is clamoring for one. I figure Mueller will speak through his indictments. But even if that has limited access to the public in the end, uh, what the uh, Southern District in New York and what the states do is a completely different issue altogether. True. Uh, another good reason not to make public statements pinning your willingness to act in any way uh, to rein in the president, how, no matter what you favor. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's handcuffed report. himself by doing that because, you know, now it's much harder for him to do it. Yeah, but well, what the story says is from a PR perspective, Trump has been unable to run the same playbook on SDNY that he's used to erode conservatives' faith in Mueller. I don't know if that's really true. The conservatives have lost faith with Mueller. Trump people have, but that's not the same thing. The right. former George W. Bush appointed FBI director, Robert Mueller, legal circles are also buzzing over whether SDNY might buck the OJ guidance and seek to indict a sitting president. Sure. I mean, I don't know why, but uh, I, I, well, the threat was highlighted when SDNY yeah. prosecutors mm -hmm. ordered officials from Trump's inaugural committee to hand over donor and financial records. Yes. It was the latest aggressive move from an office that's launched investigations into the president's company, former lawyer, and campaign mm -hmm. finance practices. Okay. New York prosecutors have even implicated Trump in a crime, and it because you know he's individual one. Don't forget, add it all up, and the result is a spate of hard to stymie, legally perilous probes that appear on track to drag on well into Trump's 2020 re-election campaign. 
SDNY stands poised to carry on Mueller's efforts, whatever the special counsel's office uh, does and, and when they close shop. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that it indicates the willingness to indict a sitting president, but it's another front in the... Uh, well, it says right here, fight. legal circles are buzzing, so therefore, you know, it must be true, right? Well, I mean, uh, that was Friday afternoon. They were all buzzing. Yeah. Uh, while that's going on, another aspect of the Mueller case that's recently come to light for Americans uh, who are not paying incredibly close attention, former What'd Cambridge Analytica director cooperated with special counsel subpoena. This is in CNN, ah. uh, February 17th, 2019, so it's relatively recent. Says you. Back in June, she was cooperating with a Mueller subpoena. Oh. And uh, she, a former director of Cambridge Analytica who visited WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange after the 2016 presidential election was subpoenaed by special counsel Mueller and cooperated according to her lawyer. Now, that okay. brings Cambridge Analytica even closer into the Mueller discussion. But part of the discussion that's going on in, in uh, the UK has to do with the fact that using the inferred data one can get from Cambridge Analytica is Facebook's model. Okay. And so the British ah, right. uh, looking into all of this, uh, and, and these are still uh, things that still have to be settled. On 18th of March, this issue and many others will be settled in the high court, says David Carroll, who's an associate professor uh, at uh, the New School, uh, reporting on some of this. But Facebook uh, got brought into it by the Brits because they were the ones that were using Cambridge Analytica data or Cambridge Analytica got the data from Facebook. And uh, Elizabeth Denham told the committee in England that the uh, the ICO, which is the committee, I suppose, that's uh, looking at this, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they found uh, the presumption that political parties do not regard inferred data as personal information was significant. In other words, uh, the political parties were using the mm. personal data that uh, shoppers might give to companies so that you can get those targeted ads about buying certain shoes or or certain dresses based on the uh, websites that you were frequenting. And political parties are doing that only a whole lot more. Yeah. Uh, and Elizabeth then told the committee that the ICO found that business practices and the way applications interact with data on that platform, which is to say Facebook, to have contravened data protection law. That's a big statement and a big mm -hmm. finding in oral evidence. Elizabeth Denon said that Facebook does not view the rulings from the Federal Privacy Commissioner in Canada or the Irish ICO as anything more than advice. Oh. She said that from the evidence that Richard Allen, Vice President of Policy Solutions at Facebook, had given, she thought that unless there's a legal order compelling a change in their business model and their practice, they're not going to change anything. And the story goes on to suggest that a lot of people at Facebook knew this was happening, but somehow or other they never bothered to tell Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, he was busy. Yeah. Maybe. We were keen to know which and when uh, people working at Facebook first knew about this Cambridge Analytica data breach. The ICO confirmed in correspondence with the committee that three senior managers were involved in email exchanges earlier in 2015 concerning the breach before December 2015, when it was first reported by The Guardian, and at the request of the ICO, we've agreed to keep the names confidential. But it would seem this important information was not shared with the most senior executives at Facebook, leading us to ask why. So senior people at Facebook knew this, but Zuckerberg didn't. Hmm. Uh, which one? Are you, which uh, article are you a, reading from? The CNN. This is a David Carroll ah. uh, a tweet storm trying to hone oh. in on what the Brits are doing with data. There it is. Okay. And uh, it's got a lot more one. information than just there the sketchy is. stuff that CNN yes, had. So, I see. yes, okay, they're asking for about Cambridge Analytica, but there's a whole lot more to the story. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The real question is how Cambridge Analytica, which we know, we know this from previous stories, mm -hmm. interacted with Facebook and what was Facebook's role. Yes. Well, I would like to know more about that. And uh, they are digging into it. And uh, apparently they've been they've been on that trail uh, and we haven't. Uh, the UK has right. been digging into that. The United States, uh, at least special counsel, mostly has not. Uh, they also, I, I saw over the weekend, were giving some indication we need to start looking at uh, Russian election influencing and disruption as well. Can't leave yes. that to the Americans that's happening here 
as well. Exactly. So this, what I was leading to is this uh, David Carroll tweet, which I just thoroughly enjoyed. It says, UK Parliament to the US, cheerio, you might want to investigate Facebook for Rico, Uh jolly good show, carry on. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure they agree. That that. pretty much summarizes the (laughs) Right. Well, you know, we got to get into, uh, is there any way we can involve the Australians in this? I'd love to hear their input. (laughs) Crikey. Right. (laughs) Crikey, Facebook is driving me crazy. All right. You say so? We'll look at it. If you say so. Uh, so the report facts a, packs a wallop, and Brexit is brought into it too. Oh yeah, there's a Canadian link. Oh, and eh? it's just sorry, fascinating. I mean, there's just so much to this whole uh, election interference stuff. I guess you should look anywhere they speak English. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know Russia's been involved in all of it. So that's all there for uh, uh, Mr. Mueller, Bobby Three Sticks to go sort through. So that's why he yeah. might not like totally be done yet. Yeah, well, he may have to go on for some time. Interesting. Yeah. And with that, you know, you've got like a minute before the break, so second half is yours. Right. True. Second half of this minute. Uh, second half of the show. You got a whole hour to go. No. Oh. <sighs> what are you going to talk about? Uh, Armando. <laughs> that, Probably. That, that could take days. Yeah. It all started. All right. Never mind. <laughs> Okay. Well, yeah, that's a great place to start. We have a lot to look at. A lot of people uh, emailed me an awful lot about what happened. Over the By weekend, the way, in the has UK. Armando been on the show recently? He should. Yes, be. Uh, he was, and I think he's threatening to do it again. Good. So we will see. Uh, we on. had a nice Friday conversation, and I, I think when we left off on Friday, he said, "All right, I'm going to continue this on Monday." So we may do Yay. that. Except he'll have to remind me what it was. Yeah, I'll I never well know from minute to minute. All right, so you're here. I'm gone. Yes, this you. is Greg Dworkin speaking to my good friend David Waldman, Kegro, in the morning. Right. Uh, break coming up and then uh, part two of the show in just a few minutes all right excellent thanks very much for nominating me for the nobel prize and coming by today I that was the omelet it. prize I believe. yeah oh yes right uh delicious except you know how i am with cheese all right well uh we'll catch up with you again on wednesday whether uh what well what do they say when they say this? there's a word that comes out the weather permitting that's the one that's the word i'm looking for okay we'll be back after a one minute break think of the next word we want to use I don't have this problem again Armando you're welcome of course as always if you even remember what we were going to continue talking about if not I'll dig that up over the next minute too welcome back now to the K-Girl in the morning show all right let's see here uh, I forgot my the second half of my line here on Netroots Radio in case you didn't know it doesn't matter uh, you're listening and uh, I'll remind you nonetheless and probably next break too uh, Armando remember what we were talking about so that's good news it was Elliot Abrams and we absolutely uh, should catch up on that but also more on the 25th amendment is what well. almost seems like ancient history at this point the Elliot Abrams thing. and it's only been a couple of days we shouldn't forget about this guy He's going to be making trouble for some time to come. Let's, uh, uh, well, I'll say, well, I'm open to both. Let me run through a couple of stories that uh, at least require mention. And uh, I I did, uh, I I mentioned earlier, and I I wasn't kidding about this. Let's see if I can find, where did I put this uh, piece here about, uh, I, I, I was only kidding uh, or that I wasn't kidding about having to check the record on Trump's uh, Nobel Prize nomination. Well, first of all, the reality, the real, the, the current story, uh, I guess was, I guess I saw it first broken at Reuters. They're the ones who got the report that the Japanese government had. At f- was responding to a request, had fielded a request from the U.S. government, though no one knows so far, I don't think, where in the U.S. government that the prime minister nominate Trump for the Nobel Prize. So uh, they've confirmed, I think that would count as a confirmation that they've done it. What I don't know is why they did it and or who asked them to do it. But let's see, I, I saw a few minutes ago, and I had it, handy and then i saw i think justice actually handed me a copy of this as well yeah here it is i knew it was from the huffington post or the the huff post now i know i tweeted about it and i don't think i stuck it in pocket and that's an unfortunate thing but here uh mary 
Papenfuss, whose um, whose work I am not familiar with, but uh, I'm taking her word for it for now. Uh, in the politics section over at HuffPost, so you know they're taking it seriously. It's not in the entertainment section. Trump claims Japanese prime minister nominated him for a Nobel Peace Prize. The president also, he says, was nominated in 2017 and 2018, but officials determined that both nominations were forged. So I wasn't kidding when I brought that up, nor was I wrong when I said I thought that it was two times that it had happened. And, uh, I mean, he hasn't been in office that long, so it seems like difficult to have shoehorned in two forged nominations in just over two years. But I guess they managed to do it. Uh, what the nomination would have been in for in 2017, I have no idea. But uh, I guess if you're forging it, who cares, right? President Donald Trump said Friday that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has nominated him for a Nobel Peace Prize because Trump said he made Japan feel safe. And that was his second grab at that one. I think the uh, the actual transcript is that they feel good. And then he realized right away that doesn't make any goddamn sense in terms of the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, they feel safe. Yes, after his negotiations with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, which is extraordinarily unwise. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to. I can't Anglo-splain to the Japanese whether or not they should feel safe. If they don't feel safe, that's their thing. Anyway. He gave me the most beautiful copy of a letter, which I thought was a funny construction. It's also he loves to throw in everything's beautiful. I mean, a beautiful copy of a letter. The letter is the letter and a copy of it looks like a letter. It's a copy of a beautiful letter, maybe. But OK, from Trump diction, he gave him a beautiful copy of the letter that he sent to the people who give out a thing called the Nobel Prize, which indicates to me. I don't know whether he was trying to be like. I don't know what, it's a little thing called the Nobel Prize sort of thing, or he hasn't got any idea who are the people who give out the Nobel Prize. Uh, but that's the way he put it. The, the people who give out a thing called the Nobel Prize. Trump said during his announcement that he was declaring a national emergency on the southern border. That had a lot to do with it, of course. I have nominated you. This was a very interesting, the whole section smacked of the kind of thing that he was making up. And I think that uh, you would have been justified in thinking that it was all garbage, that it was all a lie. But apparently the nomination has actually been made this time. Anyway, but uh, uh, it's just a weird way of putting it. Trump said, uh, I have not, It's I guess speaking as Abe, presumably paraphrasing, if not quoting from the letter, I have nominated you respectfully. On behalf of Japan, I am asking them to give you the Nobel Prize, he added, and he's not asking the Japanese to give them the Nobel Prize. That's not up to them. Them. Well, even Shinzo Abe didn't know exactly who he was asking to give you the Nobel Prize. Uh, so this he added, and as the writer at the Huff Post says, apparently quoting the prime minister. I have very little confidence that the prime minister's words were anything close to that, but that's what Trump said, which you should take to mean that's not what's in the letter. Trump complained, believe it or not, that he didn't expect to win the award, even though Barack Obama was granted a peace prize in 2009. But that's OK, he said, which is Trump speak for. I'm furious about that. They gave it to Obama. He didn't even know what he got it for. He was there for about 15 seconds and he got the Nobel Prize. Trump groused in the Rose Garden. He said, oh, what did I get it for? With me, I'll probably never get it. Uh, that's probably true. The president was nominated, it says here, for the prize in 2017 and 18. He wasn't, in fact, because the Nobel Committee determined that both nominations were, quote, forged, unquote. I'm not certain what that means, that it's put in quotes like that. Olav, uh-oh, Njolstad, I think. N-J-O-L, Njol, I'm guessing, Stad, S-T-A-D, uh, uh, Secretary of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, and remember there are two Nobel committees, uh, but isn't, huh, isn't isn't the Nobel Peace Prize awarded by the Swedish government, but the Nobel Prizes for everything else awarded by the Norwegian uh, Committee? And uh, if so, what would the Norwegian Nobel Committee know about the forgery of a Peace Prize nomination? I don't know. 
the whole thing is crazy. Maybe the reports are the ones that are nuts. Who knows? It's, it's just weird top to bottom. But Olav says that last year, investigators came to the conclusion, says that they believe the same person assumed the identity of the same qualified nominator in both instances, which is amazing because if you forged one in 2017, you would hope that by 2018 they'd be not only on to you, but have done something about it. But I guess the wheels of justice turn slowly in Norway as well. And I don't know what to tell you, but uh, by 2018, they weren't fooled by it in 2018. But imagine thinking you had gotten away with it. I mean, I guess they, I guess whoever did it, I'm sorry, but this is linked. And now I have to like open it up to see if I can get some information about that. But to continue with the HuffPost story, just so you get the gist, someone's forging this stuff. The information was turned over to local police, Njolstad, told the New York Times, and investigators reached out to the FBI. They're a little busy. No other details were provided. So they reached out to the FBI. I guess that is supposed to imply that an American did it, which stands to reason. Who else would nominate Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize? He has fans internationally, but uh, I guess the bulk of them would be here. So that's a good place to start. An official from the Japanese embassy. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one more small paragraph here. HuffPost reached out to the Japanese embassy in Washington and consulate in New York, but officials had not responded by late Friday. We got the news by Saturday through Reuters and other sources now have confirmed, I guess, the Japanese government is willing to say they did send a letter. When we're going to get a beautiful copy of it, I don't know. An official from the Japanese embassy in Washington told Kyodo News that there would be no comment. The Japan Times reported this. Uh, another embassy official told Japan Today, uh, not you know, that's the publication. I don't know what they're saying to Japan as a whole on this day. But Japan Today, the publication, uh, was told that uh, there was no knowledge of such a letter from Abe. But I guess now that now there is. Hmm. Japan's foreign ministry told the Associated Press that it was unaware of Trump's remark but could not comment on details of conversations between Trump and Abe. I have a feeling that the Japanese are not that happy with Abe and the way he, or maybe they love it. They, they like the idea of him rolling Trump on everything. I don't know. A Japanese nomination for a Nobel Peace Prize has not been announced. This Again, this is an article from before the confer confirmation from Reuters, but still no contradiction about uh, the forgeries in any of this. Trump said last year that everybody thinks he should get the Nobel Peace Prize. There are 304 candidates, by the way, for this year's prize, according to the Nobel Committee. Nominees, names, and sponsors are kept secret for 50 years. That is, uh, I don't know. I don't know why they do that. I guess you don't want to be embarrassed. Like, I keep getting nominated and lose, or... You want to be able to claim your, I, I don't know. I'm sure they have good reasons for it. South Korean President Moon Jae-in said last year that he believed Trump should win a Nobel for his negotiations with Kim. Is It is possible that Trump confused Abe and Moon oosh, in the retelling, the Nikkei Asian Review noted. But don't worry, as as likely as that is to be true, it didn't get in the way of his actually being correct this time, which is amazing. And also, uh, the article closes out on the note that Trump and Kim are scheduled to meet on uh, February 27th and 28th in Hanoi. And honestly, if I were Kim, I would have opened with, uh, I'll meet you on February 29th and see if he caught it. But uh, he was not that, uh, he wasn't going to play games. Anyway, I, I just, I, just to switch over to find out a little bit more about this, a article in the Washington Post from... March 1st, 2018, almost a full year ago, someone forged a Nobel Prize nomination of Trump, Norwegian officials say, and this would be the second time they did it. Megan Flynn reported this a year ago. A person appears to have stolen someone's identity to nominate President Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize for the second year in a row. I don't know how much identity theft it takes to do this. It might just fake letterhead or something. Uh, Olav Njolstad is back in this one. He's the director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute and secretary of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, which awards the Peace Prize. Oh, okay, so I've got it backwards. Is the king? Is, is it the Swedish government that does everything else and the Norwegian government that does the Peace Prize? 
I really thought that was the other way around. But it's because I so rarely win. Anyway, uh, so the Norwegian Nobel Committee, which awards the Peace Prize, told the Washington Post via email, allegedly, though someone could have forged that too, that it appears the same person is responsible for both forged nominations. What uh, gall it takes to do this. The perpetrator had pretended to be someone else. Who? I want to know. To make the nomination, Njolstad said, someone who was qualified. We received many... Oh, really? We receive many invalid nominations each year in the sense that they don't meet the deadline or the nominator is in, not, in fact, qualified to nominate. So it's, I guess if, if Beth from Long Island writes in and says, I think Trump ought to get the Nobel Prize, that's not a forged nomination. That's just an invalid nomination. And they get a lot of those each year. That doesn't surprise me. Nolstad goes on to say, to my knowledge, this is the first example of a forged nomination where someone has stolen the identity of another person. Noel Studd said he discovered that the Trump nominations were forged when he called the person whose name was listed as the nominator who confirmed that the nominations were a fraud. Noel Studd, and not just, uh, you know, m- m- buyer's remorse, I guess. He declined to reveal the identity or gender of that person. Even the gender? Come on. He has filed a report with the Oslo, or rather Oslo, police district for investigation. Oslo Inspector, oh boy, uh, Rune. I'm guessing R-U-N-E, it's not Rune, but Rune, Rune Skjord, <laughs> practicing my Norwegian this morning, head of the economic crimes section, economic crimes, because there's a prize that goes with this, told the police, sorry, told the Post that police didn't know the location of the person who sent the forged nominations when asked whether they came from the United States. However, he said Oslo police have contacted the FBI for assistance. So, come on. The perpetrator, he said, had used the same false identity two years in a row. The text is jumping all over the place because the Post wants me to know about uh, Microsoft's latest AI and how it helps farmers. So I might as well share that with you. Can't get a stable look at this text here. Uh, I, it could be that they're just calling in the FBI like for forensic help. We don't think an American did this, but no one here can figure it out because Norway... I'm not really sure why they have no confidence in their investigators, but uh, all right. The process for Nobel Prize nominations and selections is secretive. Shh, don't tell anyone. And has been so since the prize's inception in 1901. The names of the nominees and any information about how the winners were selected cannot be revealed for 50 years. Nominators must meet various criteria to qualify. They're linked here if you care to look at them. They can be, among other things, members of national governments or heads of state. Certain university professors, you got to be very highly rated, apparently. Got to get the top ratings. Former Peace Prize winners, okay. <laughs> it's a closed fraternity here. And current and former members or advisors of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. That's reasonable. Njolstad says the committee routinely reviews nominations for authenticity. That's good. And this time the routine check showed there was cause for concern. He said he was limited in the details he could provide due to the ongoing police investigation. You know how that goes. Uh, last year, I guess, 329 candidates for the Nobel Peace Prize, second highest number of candidates ever, just behind 2016's 376 candidates. Of the 329 candidates, 217 are individuals and 112 are organizations. How do you like that? Last year's winner was the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons of Switzerland of greater Switzerland. (laughs) Uh, Then it goes on to talk about, you know, winners in the past decade or so. I don't know. I guess they said, we need more words from you, uh, Megan, because this is, I don't know, super important to talk more about in case people, in case we run this in Vox, people want to know what is the Nobel peace prize. And uh, we'll be able to tell them exclusively. All right. There's other, like, more important stories out there. There's other less important stories out there that I could share with you as well. Um, Let me do one or two more, hopefully on a quicker basis, and then we'll see if Armando wants to jump in and talk 25th Amendment and or Elliot Abrams. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Hmm. Uh, uh, Quickly, I'll bring this one up for the main angle, since Bill is with us this morning. How you doing? Uh... The Portland Press Herald apparently has unearthed some interesting information, and I guess we're we're not done 
with Paul LePage just yet. Newly released receipts, it says, reveal nearly a dozen trips to the Trump Hotel in D.C., the President's Luxury Hotel, part of a part of one hundred and seventy thousand dollars in out of state travel by the former Maine governor in recent years. Uh, big banner looking headline here. Maine paid for 40 rooms at Trump Hotel for LePage and staff. Uh, quickly, we'll give you the opening on that one. Former Governor Paul LePage and his staff members paid for more than 40 rooms at Trump International Hotel in D.C. during a two-year period, spending at least $22,000 in Maine taxpayer money at a business owned by the president's family. That's a domestic emolument problem, ladies and gentlemen. So we're on to that one. Uh, documents recently obtained by the Portland Press-Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram show that LePage, or the LePage administration anyway, paid anywhere from 362 to more than $1,100 a night for rooms at the luxury hotel during trips to meet with President Trump or his inner circle, attend White House events, or talk to members of Congress. Receipts from those dozen trips also show the Republican governor or his administration spending hundreds of dollars on filet mignon and other expensive menu items at the restaurant in the Trump Hotel. Those expenditures are likely to draw additional scrutiny from attorneys who have cited LePage's previously disclosed stays at the D.C. Hotel in a federal lawsuit, alleging the president is improperly profiting from the business. So good, there's an already an emoluments suit that involves LePage and his spending. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's always worth your time to check that stuff. I don't know whether, uh, when it says they paid anywhere from 362 to more than $1,100 a night for rooms, does that mean there were days when they had multiple rooms and in total they added up to $1,100 or that LePage or someone on his staff took an $1,100 a night like suite at the hotel or what, but, uh, well, likely improper, to say the least, and uh, an emoluments clause violation uh, as well. That would be the more important angle on all of that. Uh, other things happened over the weekend. We uh, were all treated to video of Mike Pence speaking to the, uh, a, all they put it here is the security conference in Munich. I don't know what the actual, uh, there we are, the Munich, well, this is the official name according to the banner behind him. They even do this now for security conferences, is the Munich Security Conference. Well, anyway, uh, we were all treated to his delivering a speech which had included in it what he believed, that is Pence believed, I think, to be applause lines and deathly silence for all of those, including the, the big line in which he says, I bring greetings from President Trump, the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump, and he pauses. I don't know whether they said pause for applause in this thing or he just has that politician sense and it's crickets in the place. And he just draws a breath and marches on. But it happens a couple of times during the speeches. And uh, later on at the same conference, Angela Merkel speaking, uh, as I guess is her prerogative at a cost security conference in Germany and uh, referencing Donald Trump's uh, idiotic threats against uh, for tariffs against German uh, imported German cars, e e BMWs, essentially, even though the vast majority of those BMWs are produced inside the United States, uh, surprised and shocked her and made no sense and was pretty much evidence that he was a, a dotard and uh, incompetent to the task. And she notes it, but in much kinder, more diplomatic words, she gets, she gets a round of applause. The only person not applauding it's pointed out in the video is Ivanka Trump listening through only one ear of a set of headphones because it's, it's not fashionable to wear both sides. Uh, all the diplomats are doing it, but not Ivanka. She's holding up one ear uh, phone to, to one. And she's got no applause for it. And that's of no surprise, I guess is she, her father is being attacked. So she's not going to applaud that. The bigger question, of course, most people pointed out what in the world is she even doing there? She's not supposed to be there. And at some point there's, uh, even footage of her speaking and I forget what she's actually addressing. Not that it matters, but again, 
uh, making points that nobody believes have any value whatsoever. Not only is she there, but someone gave her a microphone at some point as though she was an official person and deserved to speak. And I'm not really certain why that is or how that happened. And even in her role as White House advisor, none of her portfolio includes any of this. If anyone, you know, if any of the idiots from the family that he's hired, Trump has hired, have any right at all to the microphone, it would be Jared Kushner. And he has none. What she's doing with it, I couldn't even begin to tell you. It's just automatically assumed now that, uh, wherever there's a reason to travel abroad, Ivanka will take it and she's going to, you know, she'll, she'll be the one representing the family slash country. Cause that's how, well, that's how bad it is with the nepotism in this gang. Okay. Uh, one other note from the Munich security conference I noticed was from, uh, Paula Chertok who tweets, uh, she, she, by the way, a linguist and lawyer and writer and a, I guess, uh, is she from the, uh, is she from Russia or just cover Russia intensely? And she says, analyzing propaganda, media, Russia, Ukraine, post USSR, but noting very interestingly, uh, in response to other uh, folks who are watching at the senior uh, Alexander Gabuev, uh, senior fellow and chair of Russia in Asia Pacific program at Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, both of them tweeting back and forth, I guess, about what was going on there. And uh, apparently Sergey, is that right? Is that his name? Sergey Lavrov. Lavrov is the uh, foreign minister, right? Of uh, Russia noting Europeans. He's, He's urging them to drop the transatlantic partnership with unreliable Americans and build a joint European home with the Russians instead. And parenthetically, and Moscow will help EU talk to China. And Paula Chertok noting Lavrov here going all dark lord. Imagine Russia, who brazenly stole a chunk of Europe, tells Europe, come to our side. We're the reliable ones, not the Americans. This, of course, imaginable only because of Trump and Putin dark arts and backfiring already. The NATO alliance, she says, will emerge stronger than ever from all of this. But it's a very interesting point that uh, part of the byproduct of having disrupted American politics by having us allegedly elect an idiot like Trump, uh, who A is visibly doing Russia's bidding and everything and B doing everything he can to, for whatever reason, perhaps at Russia's insistence, undermine our traditional alliances and show us to be an unreliable international negotiating partner by having us withdraw from a half a dozen or more previous agreements now gets to play on the idea that Russia, not America is the more stable and reliable of the two former uh, superpowers, and that Russia being at least partially European, although I've always thought that was a weird designation, but anyway, uh, was the more natural partner for Europe. A very dangerous thing, although uh, the good news is most of Europe is headed by governments who, you know, know what the hell is going on in the world, and actually have a pretty, you know, reliably dim view of cooperation with the Russians. But the, the idea that this is even a plausible argument is due largely to the success the Russians have had in saddling the United States with a president so stupid and unreliable that this actually resonates. And it's going to resonate for a large part, at least of Eastern Europe, where, of course, the Russians have also been successful in replacing a lot of stable governments with reliable, to them, idiots as well. So I guess, uh, uh, well, uh, kudos to them for having uh, rearranged and rescrambled Europe to their advantage. And everyone knew that they always wanted to do so, and I guess now we have evidence that they have. All right, that brings us to our 
next break or almost to our next break and then our last segment. We will make that one an Armando segment because we do need to catch up on, uh, even if not Elliot Abrams, and certainly more discussion of the 25th Amendment. Um, we have to help you out with that because Harvard law professors appear unable to do the job, or at least Alan Dershowitz does. Uh, not only did we learn last week that Alan Dershowitz was pretty sure that the, the 25th Amendment was unconstitutional, which makes no sense whatsoever, but uh, I guess he issued a challenge over the weekend, easily answered by, uh, I don't know, probably uh, two dozen people on Twitter, to which he never returned, but uh, perhaps we can pick up with details about that and any other strange and breaking news that we care to shoehorn in. Uh, in the next segment. So, Armando, uh, warm up your Skype. We'll be back in two minutes and uh, continue the discussion then. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right. Well, in fact, we're back, and we probably uh, talked straight through our <laughs> return, and that's okay. Uh, we, we do things the natural way here, and uh, there's no blinking signs to let us know what's going on. Okay. So, you know yeah. we are, David? You know where we are? Uh, what? Authentic. Ah, that's it. That's right. Americans would uh, have a beer with us even now at ten thirty in the morning. <laughs> so it's making All me the think like I want Americans it. would be drinking with us right now. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not happening. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, the, the diners around here will serve you. So okay, uh, yeah. Well, we've got a full plate of issues: little stories, big stories, large narratives, overarching narratives. Um, so we'll we'll sort it out. Uh, any way you like here. Uh, 25th Amendment, Electoral College, Elliot Abrams. Uh, I just remember take your pick. Uh, d- d- would, uh, would, uh, to start just, it might just take two minutes. Yeah. Uh, and you've been right all along. And I've hey. sort of been, yeah, 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 you're right, David, but I was not thinking about it as much as probably I should have. You know, this whole McCabe goes on and says all the things he said last night. And, and oh. I have no love for andrew mccabe Hmm. at all i think he's pretty weaselly jerk face and i think he did lie (laughs) about the i think he did lie to the fbi about the fact that he leaked anti-hillary stories to the wall street journal Ah. uh which is is ironic as hell as the basis for trump firing him yes i fired him because he was lied about leaking anti-hillary stories come on yeah okay i mean and, and then of course even in the even in the uh, discussion of it afterwards, he he was unclear about that. He, he didn't even bother bringing that up. He forgot that that was the excuse. Yes, so. exactly. Uh, but but it does bring to the points the stories he was telling, which we all know. In fact, some of them we know publicly. The yeah. I believe Putin over the intelligence <laughs> agency story. We told us that in an open press conference with Putin standing beside him. Yes, that's true, and. Uh, no different. Again, one other parallel, no different there from, you know, in case you think this is an astonishing break with historical Republicanism. The last Republican president uh, called him Pooty Poot and said he looked into his eyes and saw his soul. And, you yeah. know, I forget this. Yeah, absolutely. Because he paints, like I said, the Friday. Oh, wow. so yeah, cute. Ray, Reagan sold arms to the Iranians. I mean, yeah. uh, it's. In his heart, he says he didn't, but we, but, I, <laughs> but the papers say I did. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well. Remember that one. <clears throat> anyway, my point is, everything we've said about the unfitness, psych, psychological, mental capacity, yeah, about Trump, it's been true from the day he came down the escalator, and the Republicans nominated him, and everybody decided Hillary's going to win anyway, so let's attack Hillary. 
yeah. talking about the media here. Mm-hmm. With that that crazy guy won't be president. Well, the crazy guy became president. We were supposedly had these things in the Constitution. I remember you always remember, talk about the Electoral College. Let's start yes. with that one. Oh, that was going to save us from people like Trump. Yeah, that was a forgotten thing. I know everybody was thinking, oh, well, he's just a jerk, so don't vote for him, or there's some kind of fraud. Forget the fraud. You know, the Electoral College, I always learned in civics, you know, as a, a, I don't know, in the grade school. Uh, why do we have this stupid thing that doesn't make any sense? It was a big surprise to like sixth graders. You know, you don't really vote for president. Oh, yeah. Well, that's in case, you know, uh, someone who's totally unfit for office. Somehow wins yeah. the election. Wins the, wins if they were the to win the popular vote, they would stop, stop it. Them. Right. Well, and then we found so. out not only do they love crazy people, but everyone, to a person, all the members of the Electoral College said, I don't think I'm allowed. These are the people, the Constitution says uh, Americans don't really vote for president. There's this very special select group of people. I don't think I'm allowed to do that. And that's partially because electors have become nobodies. They were supposed to be prominent citizens who were supposed to have the presence of mind and confidence in self to do something like that. But instead, you know, presidential no- campaigns nominate their own electors, which makes a certain amount of sense. But yeah, just as an aside, there were certain laws uh, mm. in certain states about faithless electors. Yes. Right. Uh, I would argue, and I think you would argue, that those laws are unconstitutional. If the 25th Amendment is, so is that. Yeah. Well, no, I mean the state law. Yeah. The state law well, that really, honestly. seeks to tell an elector who has a constitutional role yeah. how he must vote, that law is probably not constitutional. It may very well not be. No one has ever tested because who cares? Because but... who cares? Because we don't actually believe in an electoral college. Oh, well, there's that. Yeah. And I would say before 2000, we really didn't think much about the electoral college because the popular vote winner would almost always yeah. win we hadn't for a long time at least yeah rutherford b hayes i believe was the last winner of the electoral college <laughs> i love that name oh b hayes uh, oh no i'm not that's not correct <laughs> benjamin harrison actually. oh okay i got well, the wrong name correct. he beat samuel tilden wow. uh in the electoral college but lost the popular vote and then of course al gordon Yes. But that was a very close electoral college race, so people didn't focus on that. Mm. And then, of course, in 2004, John Kerry almost won the presidency. Uh, 80,000 votes in Ohio uh, uh, would have given Kerry Ohio, and he would have won the presidency Mm -hmm. and lost the popular vote. Uh, It's a shame that didn't happen for many reasons. One of those, which is we might have had a bipartisan consensus that this whole electoral college thing not just mm, in terms of the electors, true. but right. in terms of the way we count the votes, was just unacceptable in a modern democracy. Yes. The popular vote winner, we have one contest. It happens to be the most important one in the entire country. Yeah. Where the popular vote winner isn't guaranteed victory. Yeah. That's odd. It's wrong. You're right. We would have had a, there would have been bipartisan, bipartisan consensus. It, had, it is strange how it never goes wrong for them. Well, it almost went wrong that. I mean, and it, it, didn't. it would have been something. But uh, And then, of course, for the uh, second time in many, uh, in what, four elections or, yeah, four elections, uh, yeah. we won the popular vote. We Democrats won the popular vote, and they did. Okay, but uh, forget about that because that's really not the point about the Electoral College point, which is that you've read it out of the Federalist Papers. Oh, well, what's the Electoral College about? Well, when some crazy, corrupt, unfit guy somehow sneaks in, they can stop it. Yep. Well, here it's that crazy, corrupt, unfit guy. Did it stop it? No. So forget about that. All right, well, what about the next thing? The amendment that, as you said, and Alan Dershowitz said, is unconstitutional. Yeah. The 25th Amendment. And somehow, and I saw it this morning, uh, Rod Rosenstein and Andrew McCabe said, this guy's really crazy. He's unfit. We should maybe talk to the cabinet and see if they're yeah. willing to invoke the 25th Amendment, which yeah. is, you know, a constitutional amendment, which is like perfectly legal to consider. Yes. Of course, it's also impossible because who picks the cabinet? The president does. I mean, I know it happened. Yeah. I know it happened on 24 with Dr. President Palmer, but that was TV. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, a, 
it's a thing. It exists. And I guess, you know, in FBI world, those guys, I guess, and especially as the two of them are Republicans, they probably it was probably easier for them to come to the conclusion they, they I'm sure they thought it was a long shot, too. But they probably considered, well, we're Republicans and we can see he's crazy and unfit. I don't see why those Republicans wouldn't also see it. Many of them ran against him in the primaries. And said he was crazy and unfit. Yeah. So, you know, we'll probably lose, but we'll talk to them because what else are we going to do? You know, this got portrayed as an FBI coup attempt or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's a a coup. No, no, but better than that, it's an illegal coup attempt. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and right. So Dershowitz was saying that it was unconstitutional because clearly this is supposed to be about, uh, mental incapacity to which most of the country said, yeah. And what else do you want to say? Uh, but he was like, well, no, you can't just remove him because you suspect you know, suspicion of, uh, espionage or influ- foreign influence isn't covered by the 25th Amendment, which is just Dershowitz is speculating. And I, I kind of wish that was what it was about. It doesn't say anywhere. And he's got a good re- you know, he's got a decent argument, but it doesn't matter. That wasn't what they were talking about anyway. They, they really did mean he was mentally incompetent to the task. And because he was so mentally weak, he put the country at risk of manipulation by the Russians. They knew about the attempt. It just wouldn't work on most presidents. But this one it would work with because he's mentally incompetent to the task. So they were thinking, we'll, we'll ask the we'll ask the cabinet. Uh, you know, others then began to portray this, like I said, as an FBI coup, as though the FBI could remove him from office. They were saying, <laughs> exactly. I'm going to ask the right people what they think. And uh, I, I think in the interview yesterday, McCabe claims to have said nothing <laughs> in res- well gee whiz rod i don't know and that was the end of the discussion i found frankly unbelievable and i think so did the interviewer you really you didn't say anything yeah i, I think mccabe is is a not a good liar but uh any and, and i think he's a liar too and i think he's a proven liar but that's neither here nor there the fact is the man is incapacitated and if t- uh, if they did discuss the possibility of invoking Section Four of the of the Twenty Fifth Amendment, mm-hmm. that's not crazy. In fact, it sort of means that okay, well, at least somebody thought this Twenty Fifth Amendment meant something. Yeah, or the Electoral College. <laughs> now that that was now that that avenue was closed off, I mean, clearly, I, I think well, maybe they didn't realize it at the time. But Rosenstein and. Uh... And McCabe probably gave some thought to that, too, around Electoral College time. Like, why don't these guys stop him? He's obviously an idiot. Right. I mean, and but he's more than just an idiot. He's he's unfit. He, yes. He, well, yeah. He, 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 I think he's mentally deficient. We can have idiot presidents. We have. Um, I think there is a tremendous likelihood that he has been corrupted by foreign governments. Yes. Not just the Russians, the Saudis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's. It's one thing that they to have people not recognize it when going to the voting booth, which is a you know frankly a a permanent stain on on the country. To be honest with you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) though, again, uh, the majority did recognize it and voted against them. Yeah, by Uh, millions. It's just the great uh, idea that the founders came up with the electoral college stuck. But here we are. Yeah. So what I'm saying is. It's just sort Sorry. of an amazing. What do you? And it, it just brought me back to all your points. Well, wait a second. What do you mean we can't be talking about impeachment yet? It's obvious he should be impeached. It's obvious he should be removed from office. And you're right. It is obvious. Yeah, I always thought so. It's still obvious. And I don't say I never said that about when George W. Bush first came into office. Um, I think there was grounds later on when he violated. Um, uh, the uh, FISA laws uh, mm-hmm. to argue that maybe that rose to an impeachable offense, but certainly we didn't come out of the gate saying, "Okay, the guy should be impeached." No. He's crazy. We said he's stupid. With, in fact, yeah, we said he was an with, idiot. Yeah. But he's not unfit in the way that they, at, a, at the, to the constitutional level. But this guy was obviously unfit, and he's proven it day after. Can you imagine we went through this that whole 
crowd size thing the first day he became president. Yeah, right. How that's does that true. not tell you he's unfit? Yes. I mean, if you weren't convinced to begin with, then you even on that day, you would say, well, boy, he's a very sad disappointment. Uh, but you would at least have to come away, fairly speaking, with the idea that this guy could lose his grip on reality if he hasn't already uh, over something that's actually important because it was so weird how hard he was pressing and how how uh, really honestly how he was using the leverage of the power of the presidency to you know to bolster his claims that meant nothing whatsoever it was pure ego but he was leaning on people and threatening their livelihoods in their government jobs unless you you know, assuage my ego. That, that, what kind of danger does that put us in? And you might have said, ah, you know, but when it's something that's really important, he would never, you know. But then, of course, we found out. Yeah. Oh, oh by the way, yeah, uh, I don't know. The, you, the inauguration crowd thing doesn't bother you. Um, let's dissolve NATO. Well, gee whiz, that's actually a bigger thing now that you talk about it. But. You know, it's his prerogative. <laughs> you know, he, he, people were making excuses. The president can uh, make choices about uh, alliances and he's got to put it before Congress, but blah, blah, blah. You know, well, hold on. <laughs> You're talking about a very big uh, step here that may undermine the entire international order and result in uh, global thermonuclear war. Hey, well, if it does, we'll, you know. We'll we'll talk about it, but for now we'll, we'll survive that. Oh, no yeah, problem. Right? Uh, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know, and, and I don't know. Uh, I, I guess back to even to, to Dershowitz's thing that he originally was saying. Well, you, you know, uh, the Twenty Fifth Amendment isn't a substitute for impeachment. If you think he's guilty of maladministration, you can't Twenty Fifth Amendment him. And it's an well, interesting argument, but. No, so but what? it is. It, it's it's not, and it's I'm, incorrect. It's, it's, it's well, right, but it's an interesting I mean, one. It but, is a substitute for the impeachment process, but it a good actually one. has a second piece, which yeah. you've always pointed out. That is the twenty-one days later. Mm -hmm. It's a much higher bar than even impeachment because it requires two-thirds vote of both yes. the houses of the Congress. Yeah, uh, Dershowitz when he came back to this subject said, you know, you can't use it to circumvent impeachment. And I challenge anyone to uh, argue otherwise. And well, you know, OK, the argument is that there's no circumvention whatsoever. It, 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 the, the, the majority of the cabinet votes him out, essentially, or temporarily. That's the way it works. You say it's you're suspended for 21 days. The president can at his option and i mean if you opt not to then there's nothing i can do to help you but you can write then you write a letter and say i'm not incapacitated and at that he's reinstated as president unless at that point the majority of the cabinet again says no you're really not okay and petitions congress essentially and congress then decides the question as between the competing letters you're supposed to write letters uh, one right. says he's incapacitated and it's signed by a majority of the cabinet. The other says, signed by him, no, I'm not. And then you vote and you vote. And, and if two thirds of both houses, which is harder I mean, to get. You can think the 25th Amendment is stupid and I kind of do. Yes, it is a little But it's dopey. there. It's written. What Dershowitz yeah. was just saying was complete nonsense. It has nothing yeah. to do with impeachment. They're two different functions. They are. But, uh, you know, if the test of its legitimacy ultimately is. Hey, as we always said, impeachment is whatever you can get the House yeah, but, to say it is. Uh, well, if you can impeach, if, if two thirds of both houses of Congress say the president isn't the president, that is all there is to it. You don't get to appeal it based on, well, but you were supposed to prove that he did X, Y, Z. Now, the vote's the vote. The question the is, do we remove him? The vote says yes. Or whatever the white vote, or he's in a. He has the he's yeah. unable to discharge this. The phrase yeah. the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't be able to undo think, an impeachment because of a typo. To. That's that's my I say that honestly. It's what I believe. He is yes. unable to but discharge. Yeah. He, the powers he can't do it. As we're watching him not do it right now. Right. National emergency going to the golf course. You can't you can't do that. That's not discharging the office. One That's of those things point. isn't true. 
Yeah. And it's silly for Dershowitz to argue somehow it's unconstitutional to reach that conclusion. Yes. Meanwhile, this morning or maybe yesterday, he, he's now he's sort of, I don't know whether he's backpedaling or whatever, but back in the mix, Dershowitz says uh, uh, it's uh, th- th- his uh, exercise of the emergency powers is a mistake. But OK, oh, he did. Yes. Oh, it's a, quote, mistake, unquote. Yeah, that's different. Is it an somehow, impeachable offense? He didn't address that, but it is. Oh, why not? Because <laughs> uh, it is. And if he said so, that he would not be able he to eat be lunch. Fox at News the, anymore? Uh, maybe. Or he wouldn't be able to eat lunch at the club or, you know, Jeffrey That's Epstein's right. charges would come back to haunt him instead. So I don't know. I'm not really sure. Maybe. I don't know what he's trying to maintain here, but it was, it was a terrible weekend for for him. But who cares? He's an idiot. Yeah, Congress has the authority to rescind Trump emergency. You know what it's going to take to do that? Two-thirds of the Senate. Why don't we just go to, I think, I know a, a, a podcast mm. host who said that just the other day. Why don't we just go straight to impeachment and removal instead? Okay. If we need the two-third votes anyway. Yeah, or pack it all up in one. I'm going to have one vote, and uh, it's on an omnibus package of 25th Amendment removal, impeachment, and cancellation of his national emergency. Right. Well, anyways, you can see uh, you've convinced me that, that I there's no well, yeah, it's true, but there's no tr- but true but now. This is just if we should be saying this every day. He should be he should be out. He should be out now, not in 2020. He should be out today. Yes, well, it's very dangerous. He won't be, but we should still say it because that's the truth. The truth yeah. actually matters sometimes. Yes. Well, we like to think so. You know, although we always say nothing matters. Uh, it feels like nothing matters because you say that you tell the truth all the time and everybody says, yeah, well, you know, that's very radical. But well, we we're not running for office. We and if we can't yeah. tell the truth, who can? Right. It's up to us. I mean, I understand. At least why people someone have to should tell the it. truth. Right. Sure. Right. Anyway, you got 10 minutes for Elliot Abrams if you want to go. Yeah, sure. That. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't get enough. Well, from- you were reading a, a tweet storm from a guy. <laughs> mm, yeah. I don't know if you still have that in your pocket. Uh, somewhere, yes, in the in the archives. Yeah. I could tell you about why you look for it if you want. I can tell you my own experience. I was in uh, college uh, during uh, the 80s, mm-hmm. and Latin America and Central America in particular were very high-profile, big issues, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, especially – uh, it was an interesting period for uh, different aspects yeah. of it. Brazil right, back yeah. then had a military dictatorship. Armando, I'm gonna like I'm gonna let you go for a second. I actually somebody rang the doorbell. <laughs> you All start. Right. I'll be right back. Talking. Okay, well, good. I'll just keep talking about no problem. Uh, what Latin America was like in the 80s. Peru had a military dictatorship in the 70s and uh, early 80s. Brazil had a military dictatorship. Venezuela actually was a corrupt democracy, but there was, you know, some legitimacy there. Chile was ruled by Pinochet. Uh, Argentina had its generals who, of course, lost the Falkland Wars, which led to their downfall. This was a different era. This was an era when Gene Kirkpatrick would talk about uh, authoritarianism being uh, uh, better than and uh, then communism. And whether you want to argue that point or not, the United States was not pro-democracy at all. At all. During the Reagan era, where they had some terrible people in office. And one of the terrible people was one Elliot Abrams. Elliot Abrams' ideas have been thoroughly discredited. Much of what he advocated for is why there... Uh, and it, you know, it's not, it didn't start with Elliot Abrams, uh, you know, United Fruit Company, and everything else. You guys know the stories. Mm. Now, personally, I am incredibly anti-communist, though that's not a big deal anymore. Communism is, as an ideology, is basically dead. Uh, there yeah, is you're kleptocracy. A now. Oh, you're back. Yes, it's a big day. Termite inspection day. I, I always give them my, my <laughs> Gene Kirkpatrick spiel and yes. the history of the United States and Latin America and, and all the problems, and but focus specifically on the 80s when mm-hmm. uh, Elliot Abrams 
steps into the picture. Yes. In El Salvador, in Nicaragua, uh, Honduras, and Guatemala. And I was telling him that basically most of South America was ruled by military dictatorships at that point in time. Uh, yes. So right. it was a different uh, time and place. And Elliot Abrams was one of the true scumbags of the period. Yes. Uh, he defended death squads. He defended uh, funding assassins. Mm-hmm. He was an immoral, immoral, not immoral, immoral, I-M-M-O-R-A-L person. Yeah. He he was part of the Iran Contra scandal. He later lied to Congress about it, was caught, and was convicted of the felony of lying to Congress. This is a man whose disgrace should have been complete and utter, and we should never see him again in public life. If someone wants to give him a cubicle in the back, mm-hmm. and one of their crazy think tanks, so he can pay the bills, I'm not going to get in the way of that. But what I don't want to ever see is Elliot Abrams' face on television ever again talking about anything regarding policy. On behalf of the government. On behalf of the United States government. Right. And now there is a tool that does that. Impeachment. Yeah. (laughs) So just so that we're aware of all that. I think everybody listening knows all that. We should have impeached him. That's that's a great point. You're going to have to start impeaching people. Yeah, you still can do it. they never come back to government. That's that's right, and uh, it's still eligible, and you can still impeach him for Iran Contra if you want to. Nothing says you can't. That's a great idea. Mm. I'd be. I think that's a fight worth having. Uh, I don't see why not. And I, uh, maybe uh, I'm sure that there are uh, uh, several Democratic members of the House who would be interested in doing that. It would, be, it would make a great discussion because, of course. It would make a splash, and then everyone would say, oh, "You're so stupid! You can't impeach a person for." Oh, actually, you can. Here's a, like a historical precedent and everything, and there's good reason why you can do it after they're out of office or if they're in office again a second or third time. That uh, that makes the point for you. The reason you can impeach people uh, after the fact, although here it isn't even after the fact. Look, I'm impeaching. He's a current official. I'm impeaching him. For yeah. for lying well, to Congress, piece because you tried to bring him back into government, right? And you know, and and, 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 and frankly, we should have been impeaching. We should have impeached him during the Obama administration when he was of no consequence to anyone, and no one could have objected to his <laughs> impeachment because they, they would have. This is a waste of congressional time. He's not in federal office. Who cares? And, yeah. Well, with Elliot Abrams, he's been back once already. The next Republican administration will probably bring him back again. Make sure that they don't. Oh, well, waste of, waste of time. I I just think the shamelessness of him even just having, yeah, thinking a, a, a House committee is going to sit there and listen to him respectfully was just yeah. an outrage in and of itself. Well, yeah, and she uh, said, uh, aren't you the guy who Congresswoman who Omar had death a point. squads yeah. and then lied well, to did. Congress about it? Yeah. I and got convicted of a felony and you're sitting here and we're supposed to listen to you? I know that's basically what you'll have. Omar said, and, yeah. and she's not wrong. Why, in no. God's name, why are you here? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, that should have been everybody's opening statement. I understand uh, you've lied to us before. So with that in mind, I have these questions for you. I don't expect me to believe your answers because you're a convicted liar. But oh, well, let's go through the charade. Why don't you lie to me now about the following? What is your policy on blah, blah, blah? You know, just preface all your questions that way. I know you're going to lie, but I have to ask you. What's your lie to this question? Yeah, right. Why not? Yeah, I mean, that, that the, the, the offense was even presenting Elliot Abrams. There was there was and I know, listen, the whole the whole Trump administration is an offense. Yes. Uh, from from top to bottom. Sure. Uh, there, there, there is nobody there anymore. You can't even say Mad Dog Mattis anymore, or uh, who the National Security Advisor guy. And mm-hmm. uh, even if you wanted to pretend General Kelly was an honorable guy, which he wasn't, but he's gone too. So who's left? Mick Mulvaney. Mm-hmm. That's the honor. All the honor I, resides I in know. Mick Mulvaney. Uh, maybe not. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and Abrams was uh, originally proposed uh, at the outset of the Trump administration, and he was blocked. And I don't think – I don't know who did it, but I guess whoever did it is gone. Yep. But, uh, I, yeah, I was surprised Both by that. brought him in probably. Yeah, most likely. I'm just curious as to who nominated him the first time and why they blocked him. And I think he may have been anti-Trump. He had made anti-Trump comments at some point. I think he was, but and, I still uh, hate him. And now, that doesn't excuse it. Yeah. You know, it's like Max Boat, uh, Greg's favorite guy. Max Boat's <laughs> disgraceful and stupid. Oh. And he shows it every other week. Oh, well, look at these things about you. But then look yeah. what the stupid thing he said the other day. And it's yeah. it's like that. It's like Crystal. Anyway, I hear the music. Oh, uh, yes. And now I need another hour to rant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tomorrow is a good day for that, too. Tuesday is wide open. So uh, right. I don't mind continuing on L.A. Abrams. It's an important point, not just him personally, but it, it, it brings us to so many other topics that absolutely need to be addressed that uh, I think we, we can certainly continue. So, all right. All right. Well, we'll thanks for helping out with that today. And, uh, you know, very important points, both about the 25th Amendment and the Electoral College. Plus, it makes it sound like I, you know, was right about stuff. I'm excellent. <laughs> well done. I appreciate it. Thank you, Armando. And maybe next time we'll, uh, we'll start the conversation a little earlier, although that threatens to, uh, eat up the whole show each time anyway. Anyhow, uh, it is time to, uh, stop so that we don't eat up Justice Putnam's show. And we are ready for another great West Coast cookbook and speakeasy coming up soon. Oh, I don't, ha- I don't have the preview. Oh, my gosh. Well, at any rate, I can tell you there are a million stories that even I didn't uh, get to in my lightning round today. Chances are, here we are, they've got a couple of them that uh, they are coming up for you next. Let's see. Uh, Stephen Santa Monica Goebbels Miller got angrier and angrier with Chris Wallace questions that he wouldn't answer. I don't know if you got a chance to see that one. If not, he'll recap it for you. Look at this, an 11-year-old student arrested by his school's resource cop. And I'll tell you why. You'll never believe From it. From Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening. To the K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Yeah, the resource officer, you'll never guess it. Actually, you probably did guess it. Maybe you even heard the story. A substitute teacher complained the student wouldn't stand to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Very important to educational uh, policy, I'm sure. And so now the kid's arrested. Fantastic for his future as well. Happens everywhere. That and much, much more next with Justice.